these negotiations, which we uh, uh, commonly call COP26, the 26th Conference of Parties for the United Nations Framework on, uh, on Climate Change and the Convention of Climate Change. And I, I want to by introducing myself and my family. So this is my family. These are the people I have left behind. These are those girls' cousins and aunts. Um, my wife is Maylin. My children are Francisco and Antonia. And between us, uh, well, those children's uh, genetic makeup basically contain the, every major culture in our Pacific. We have Indo-Fijian from my father's ancestry that were brought by indentured laborers, bought by the British colony to work in the sugarcane plantation. Um, my connection with the indigenous community through my mother from one of the northern islands of Fiji. Uh, my wife, who is, has um, uh, English blood mixed with Fijian blood, mixed with Samoan blood, Polynesian community, Kiribati, the Melanesian community, and China, which is very far away. But that is a, for me a way to, to, to say that when I come here, I am not just uh, Reverend James Barnum, the General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches, the Minister of the Methodist Church in Fiji, but I come from a community. I come from a family. I come from people who have links across our Pacific Ocean. And, uh, I love my family, I love my country, I love my region. It is a beautiful place. I hope you all have a chance to visit. If not, you can just hear the stories from Luke and his family as they go to visit. Uh, but I'm here to talk about what's going on, how do we get here, and what, what is going to happen if the climate change negotiations fail. And more importantly, what happens if there is in action in our world. I'm going to skip to a couple of slides here. When you think of the Pacific, when you think of our beautiful blue oceans, you don't usually think about this. This is a photo taken from what is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It is a bit of the Pacific Ocean, which is probably around the size of East Anglia full of plastic, choking sea life. If you wonder where our rubbish goes when we don't dispose of it thoughtfully, this is where it ends up. It flows into rivers and drains and goes into the ocean and makes its way through currents into certain places. This is emblematic of the way that we are treating our planet. Out of mind is very often out of sight. And so very often we want things to be out of sight so that it can be out of mind. This is the other aspect. Increased dependency on fossil fuels. Not only are we seeing fossil fuels impacting the climate, as you've heard from carbon emissions, etc., as you've read on the boards here, but they're also destroying the ecosystem the fragile biodiversity of our Pacific Island countries and many other communities as well. And one of our challenges as Christians is often we look at our lives, our roles as the dominators of creation. Subdue creation, take it for our own use. But actually, if you go through the, the, the Hebrew translations of the command given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, it is very much about be stewards of creation. We are not being good stewards. So climate change is the impact of our lack of good stewardship of the planet. And this is the result. This image symbolizes that every year we now experience the hottest year on record. So in the past it was like 2000 was the hottest year record in X amount of years. But every year now is becoming the hottest year of record. If we're not just experiencing it in the Pacific, people are experiencing it all over the world.
This is a map from seven years ago. Just showing the heat on a particular day on our planet in 2004. We know the stories, particularly those of you in the Northern Hemisphere know about the Arctic and the melting of the polar ice caps. But this is what the impact is for us in the Pacific. This is where my wife and Luca's wife's families in Kiribati and Tuvalu are experiencing. This is what rising sea level looks like in our context. It is not an abstract situation. This is a lived reality for people. And these are the issues that we're facing as a result of climate change. We're experiencing extreme sea level rise, extreme weather, and I was sharing with some people earlier today how in the past we would have one Category 5 cyclone every few years, every number of years. And now it is a regular thing for us. In fact, I've been told that when we get back in the cyclone season in Fiji, when I reach home after COP26, uh, we are expecting two to three Category 5 cyclones. So it's the norm now. We have increasing ocean temperatures, and small image to the left of the screen is, is what happens in just a few months. In December 2014, the coral was healthy. By February the following year, so only three months later, or two months later, depending on your sense of time, the coral was dying. Less than a year, the coral was dead. That means the whole ecosystem, that biodiversity, that life in the ocean is also affected. Because we all know about food chains. So if the small things die, then the things that feed on those small things die, and the things that feed on those ones die, and so on and so forth. And so we are finding now that when we go to fish, when our people go to fish, they're having to go further and further out to sea to find the fish. And the other, of course, the picture of the young man watching the tides come in at the king tide. They build the sea walls to protect the land. Unfortunately, when the tide comes with the rising seas, each time it's higher and higher. And my question is, how much higher are we expected to build our sea walls? A few years ago, there was a tsunami in Japan. You may have heard of this. This was around 2011, 2011 maybe now. Some while ago, when we had this massive nuclear plant in Fukushima being affected as a result. In Fukushima, they had built a two-meter seawall to protect it. The tsunami came in at 2.1 meters over the seawall. The water could not be met because of the seawall, and there was massive flooding and loss of life. And this is the next reality of our people. We used to use this word climate refugees, and in Europe, in the UK, we are aware of the situation of refugees. When there is conflict, when there is a disaster, people are displaced from one area and they move to somewhere else that is safer, where they can live. The difference is we no longer use this term refugees because at the end of a conflict, those refugees can return home. At the end of a natural disaster, when, when the land is recovered, people can return home. For our people in the Pacific, there is no real place to return to. We are seeing that by the next 50 years, if not earlier, certain parts of the Pacific, whole countries, Kiribati, Tuvalu and others, will literally disappear from the land. That is going to be their reality. This uh, tree is always reminded to me of the reality of climate change in my neighborhood, the resilience that we can have, but also that if we, if we do not change the way we are living, um, it's going to be too late for us. I want to talk a little bit about climate-induced displacement, because I want to share with you 
what the impacts of climate change are for people, the lived reality and the challenges that we face. In 2009, so 12 years ago, the Pacific Church leaders had already started to talk about the impact of climate-induced displacement and relocation and say, as churches who have a pastoral role to our people, we need to be able to guide them, to speak with them, to be pastoral and provide care and support for them when these impacts really start to hit. And so we started talking about the role of the church in three very interesting situations. For those who cannot leave, people who will refuse to leave their sinking islands, quote unquote. What does it look like for those who will have to leave? And what also does it look like for those who will receive these communities? How do we have that sense of Christian radical hospitality and neighborhood where we are called to love our neighbor? Pacific people and my brothers and sisters from Fiji who are here can attest to this. We have a not only a strong cultural attachment to land, it is almost spiritual. And you think about the ancient people of these lands, these islands, and their relationship to land. And so the destruction from a Category 5 cyclone is not just measured in terms of development setbacks or economic setbacks, but is seen as the very um, land in which they are connected to, part of their own identity being destroyed. And this is because of our sense of rootedness to place. Now, no one others here, I don't know about Luke, uh, but many of our children, when they are born, the, you know, when we come out of our mother's wombs and the nurses snips the umbilical cord, there's usually a little bit that sticks out. And I'm just, so that. Now, when it finally dries up and drops off, we have a custom all across the Pacific where we take that umbilical cord and it is buried in the soil with a tree, a, a seabird. Most common is a coconut tree, but it can be whatever is the uh, tree that is common to our, our area or significant to our area. And that signifies that that child has a place of belonging, that that child's life is rooted in the land, that they have a place to which they belong and gives them a sense of identity. What does that mean with rising seas when the land starts to disappear? This is not a room with a view. This was somebody's backyard that is now underwater. You can see in the, on the I guess that's my right hand side, the, the markers there, the stones show that was the extent of the, of the coast before. And now this is how they are living, and they had to move from these houses and relocate inland. But whose land do they relocate to? Who pays for this relocation? Who helps them in the trauma that they have to go through, that they experience when they have to uproot everything and move? And these are part of the, the challenges that we, we face. I'm sure many of us are familiar with this. Psalm, Psalm 137. And if you're not familiar with your Psalms, you may remember the song. By the river, song of Babylon. I grew up listening to that song more than reading it in the, in the Bible. But this, this Psalm resonates with our people because it's about that sense of exile. We are people who dance, sing, we love to celebrate life. How can we do that? when we're experiencing the sense of loss of identity, loss of sovereignty, loss of future. There are islands that, as I said, will no longer exist on the map anymore. But what does that mean, not just in terms of identity, but in terms of citizenship? We're, we're in the process of preparing people to be stateless because their island nation will no longer exist on a map. What's the value of that passport? Who do they then claim citizenship from? The 
church is called to be a people of transformation, people on journey. And so our work at the Pacific Conference of Churches, working with our member churches across the, the vast Pacific community, is about shifting from this concept of exile to the concept of exodus. That maybe, even if nothing is done, there still can be hope. And that's because as church, while we fight for justice, while we speak the truth, while we stand in solidarity with people who are losing everything, we must do our best to ensure that there is some hope. Because that is the Christian message. That life, not death, will have the final say. And so, there is a verse from Jeremiah, a chapter from Jeremiah, which talks about how displaced communities can live. This is a long presentation. And the other is about the spirituality of hospitality that we have to, to work with. As I said, places that people move to will already belong to somebody else. Either to indigenous communities who have that land, or if they have to move to another country, what does that mean for them? Does that mean that they go and become second-class citizens? Are they only there to be manual laborers? What is the dignity that these people experience? Where is that opportunity to have a life of dignity? And so these are some of the existential questions that we, we have to engage with. And, and we do that by reminding of the stories of what God told the Israelites during their journey in the, in, in, in the desert. When you come into your land and you meet foreigners and you meet people who are suffering, remember that you too once suffered and you too have to uh, care for these people. And so we are talking about this sense of uprootedness. How do we as church gently care for these people in a pastoral way that when they are taken from one place to another, it is done in a way that doesn't affect their dignity, is as least traumatic as possible, and gives them some hope and some dignity. Of course, that's the worst case scenario. We don't want it to reach to that point. And so what we need is what we term the ecological conversion from the throwaway culture. And so even in our own communities, we are teaching this. And this is about ways to be greeners, ways to, to live in your community that are in more, more in harmony with the planet, that are more sustainable practices, that have less impact on the climate. And if we can do it, you can do it too. And your communities can do it. Imagine when we talk about this, this word that we are used to hearing called carbon footprint. Every time you hear climate change, you will hear, what is your carbon footprint? So I traveled from Fiji to LA, Los Angeles, from Los Angeles to Heathrow, and then to Berlin. And then I had meetings in Berlin. I took a train to, uh, to Bremen in Germany for more meetings, and then to get to meetings in Geneva, Switzerland, I took 12 hours worth of train overnight to get there, so that I would keep my carbon footprint low. And every stop on the way, I'm having meetings, I'm engaging with communities to try and reduce my carbon footprint. After all this travel, six weeks away from home, when I finally get back, my, I and one of my colleagues who will be joining me in, in Glasgow tomorrow, we we'll go to some land that our church organization has purchased and plant 70 trees as a way of offsetting our carbon footprint. Now, that's great. Well done, James. But the carbon footprint of the Pacific does not even equate to the nail on your small toe in terms of the rest of the world. And here we are, people with this tiny, tiny footprint bearing the impact of everybody else's carbon footprint. And so when we talk about climate change, it is a question of justice. 
Why are we who lives, who struggle and do our best to live in harmony with creation, where we use our faith, our culture, our tradition to tell us to live in harmony with the environment, to be as gentle as possible, why do we have to suffer for the sins of others? Have you ever thought about naming climate change as a sin? Because we as a human race, the word sin means to miss the mark. And every time we don't have strong commitments at COP26, every time the conversations prolong and the, the 1.5 degree that we need to, to, to maintain gets further and further away, we are missing the mark. And so the developed nations of the world, there's only one word to describe that. It's sin. These are the people doing as much as they can to change even the small ways in which they have been negatively impacting their communities environmentally. I shared with one of our friends here today that the bulk of the work that we're talking about in terms of carbon emissions are carbon emissions that go into the air. But the bulk of carbon emissions that are affecting the planet actually takes place on the ocean. Because most of the world's trade takes place on ships. And so one of the things that we're going to lobby for, and we've been doing this for a number of years in, in the COP meetings, is to include the, the issue of oceans in, in the conversation about climate change. Can you imagine? 26 years, and they still are not talking about the impact of, of the carbon emissions into the sea, where 90% of the world's trade takes place on the ocean. Yesterday I was at the Bank of, London, the Bank of England for a National Climate Justice Memorial and I stood on the steps of the Royal Exchange and I shared with the people there and many of them did not know that at the top of the Royal Exchange, right at the top, there is a little triangle with a verse from the Bible written. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It took me a while first, I was reflecting, I was like, huh, that's interesting. And the more and more I thought about it, the more disgusted I got. How dare they take this verse talking about the earth is the Lord's and so much injustice is Investment in fossil fuels, investment in things that continue to desecrate the environment for the sake of what? Not God's glory, but for greed and for profit. And so there is a need for us to make these big shifts in our way of living. I'm a chaplain for this particular boat. It's the Utuniyalo, it means heart of the spirit. It is a traditional voyage in Kudu reminds us that a thousand years before Christ, our ancestors were sailing on ships twice as big as this, if not three times, across the ocean, using not GPS, not latitude and longitude, not sextants, but using stars, celestial navigation. But we have been told that that way is not the right way. And so there is part of us that we need to say, how do we live in more harmony with nature, with God's creation? How do we remember and practice the fact that we are part of God's creation and that we are stewards of God's creation? And so I come back to this ecological conversion because this is something that each one of us can do. Now, while you pray for us and the negotiations that take place at, uh, in Glasgow in the next two weeks, while you sign up, to petitions, to call your pension funds, etc., to divest from fossil fuel investments. Conversion is a return to restored relationship with God and with God's creation. It is a return to recognizing that we live in the oikos, the whole household of God. And this journey that you have taken as a community since September the 1st has been part of the season of creation with the theme around God's household, the oikos. And so we must continue to Talanoa. Talanoa is the sharing of stories, the sharing of truths with one another. We must continue to cry together, to dream together, 
to plan and act to restore our common home. And the work now begins on restoring our common home, but it can only be done if all of us, every single one of us, and your friends, your families, people you meet, the people you work with, regardless of whatever room we call ours in the household of God, commit to caring for the whole household. I would like you all to take a deep breath. After me, take a deep breath. Ready? And one more. Come out. The first breath you took was created, the oxygen was created by the trees and the Amazon around here. But every second breath you take comes from the ocean. More and more now, 70% plus of the world's oxygen is created in our ocean, which is under threat from climate change. So every second breath you take, enjoy it, because we're very uh, not for too long, it may be gone. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you.